Okay. 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 And start to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Professor. Let me introduce myself first. Uh, I am Yamur Çelik. I am 40 uh, year psychology student. I am an interview uh, corner at Pisinosa. Uh, can you introduce uh, yourself to Aytun? Tekrar mı tanıtayım kendimi? Okay, sorry. Uh, I am Aytunç. I study psychology for the third year uh, in university. I am also a book corner writer in uh, Pisinosa, a semi-academic journal. Uh, thanks for joining our interview, Professor. Uh, Yamur is going to start to ask uh, questions to you. So, Yamur, you can start our questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, welcome again. If you can, if you are ready, we can start the interview. Uh, before we move on to our interview, uh, we would you like to get to know you a little better uh, while reading two sources about you. I read that you are referred to as the leading uh, spokesperson of modern existential, humanist and existential integrative psychology. Can you tell us about your career and why you are called that? Well, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it short. <laughs> uh, I, I really began in this field when I was very young because my father was a, uh, a, a teacher and then he became a professor of education. And he was very interested in psychology and the psychology of children. And my mother was a radio and television spokesperson. And so she was also very interested in communications and in, in how people thought and how they behaved because she did a lot of interviews with people and she was very interested in, in life. And I had a very, uh, challenging start to my life. When I was about two and a half years old, my seven-year-old brother died of uh, several diseases. And my family, my parents did the best they could to, to help me, to work with me. After that uh, great tragedy, and uh, very, very unusual for the time, this was in the uh, late 1950s, uh, my mother actually referred me to a psychoanalyst. And so I was in psychoanalysis at six years old because I was having a lot of difficulty uh, for several years after uh, my brother died. And uh, that was uh, an extremely important uh, contact for me. And it, it really helped me to work with a lot of fears that I had about uh, death and dying and disease and the unknown. I had uh, a night terrors. I was afraid of monsters invading my, my bedroom. And I, I was very... Uh, sad and I was very angry and lost. I was lost, but the psychoanalyst helped a great deal, uh, helped, helped me be able to deal with my fears and anxieties. And I actually, I moved from a position of basically uh, paralysis and terror to gradual intrigue and and even wonder about life life and its meaning its purpose the big questions of life from a very young age uh, but i was able to do that because i was gradually more able to be present to myself and to to the world and uh, i became more and more interested in in psychology why we do the things we do what this life is about. Um, 
How do we live it as, as well as possible? And I was very interested in also in science fiction, you know, strange, uh, strange people, strange beings, uh, the universe, <laughs> uh, science. And, and there were some you know, great television shows at the time called uh, The Twilight Zone and Outer Limits. And I really appreciated these shows because they would, they would take something that looked like a monster and show that it was much more complicated. It was much, it was pointing to something that could expand and maybe deepen our consciousness. Uh, I'm thinking of one show in particular in Outer Limits where this a big monster came to the center of town and there were a lot of soldiers and town people ready to shoot it down. But it looked down at the people and said, put down your guns, go home and contemplate the mysteries of the universe, which was an amazing thing for a monster to say to people. But it, it kind of symbolized what I'm talking about in my life. Uh, seeing at first things as very scary and monstrous, but as I looked more deeply, I saw that they were pointing to some very deep questions about the mystery of our life, our lives, my life. And uh, I eventually went into psychology because it put together all these interests. I was also interested in writing. Uh, I was interested in culture and, and certainly in human behavior and experience. And uh, I had some wonderful teachers. Uh, I, I had the great fortune of having uh, not only a wonderful introduction, introductory psychology professor at my in my first class at college, but I eventually uh, met and became um, a co-authors with the founders or two of the founders of existential humanistic psychology, James Bugenthal and Rollo May. And uh, so I'm, I feel extremely blessed to have met these people. I traveled all the way across the country to be with them uh, at my graduate school, which was then the Humanistic Psychology Institute. It's now Saybrook University. Uh, I'm, I'm an adjunct faculty member there. But it was a wonderful time. Uh, that was the uh, early 1980s. Wonderful time for humanistic and existential psychology. And uh, you know, I eventually went on to write my own books. Uh, my, my first book was The Paradoxical Self, Toward an Understanding of Our Contradictory Nature. And it was a lot about what I was refer <clears throat> referring to before. It was trying to deal with you know, the, the radical mystery of life uh, trying to deal with otherness and difference from a very young age. And, you know, I, I think most of us, well, we, we all have to deal with radical mystery and difference when we're born. But it often gets covered up by rules and regulations and, and the fears of parents and of culture that uh, that ignore these big questions, you know, about life. And uh, there's, there's nothing like trauma to open it back up. When you have a big trauma, it's like, it's like a ripping open of the, the fabric of life. Uh, to its uh, what I what I call its groundlessness and helplessness that we experience when we're we're born, um, and we're 
you know, we're not very equipped to deal with that unless our parents and our culture and our circumstances support us in, in dealing with radical mystery and radical differences. Is that making sense? <laughs> yes, Professor, it's amazing to hear uh, your story in psychology. And uh, mm -hmm. also, it's uh, nice to hear that you overcome your uh, tragic past. And uh, it's like uh, you find yourself uh, with psychology. Uh, it's my personal opinion, mm -hmm. of course. I appreciate uh, that very much. It's true. I, I feel like I was born into psychology because yes. my father was reading Rollo May. Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, when I was a little boy. So it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor, uh, let me ask you the second second question. Uh, I read that you grew up grew up with psychology in your career, uh, which you progressed uh, in the light of existential and humanistic. Uh, what do you think about the progress in this area and the future of it? Well, I. I think we've come a long way uh, since uh, Rollo May introduced existential psychology to America in 1958 with his book, Existence. Uh, he was importing it from European existentialists. Uh, uh, when I say a long way, I, I, think, I think we continue to very much um, value that beginning that he and James Bugenthal uh, built for us, but we have also extended it in terms of uh, what I call existential integrative psychology or psychotherapy. So we're now looking at how the various, uh, you know, bona fide or evidence-based approaches can be understood and worked with within an overall existential uh, context. And by existential context, I mean basically getting at the root of people's problems, uh, getting, getting into the depths and the experience uh, of one's struggle, not, not only just understanding it intellectually, or changing oneself behaviorally, but helping people to, uh, well, as, as I was talking about before in my own experience, helping people to be more present to their whole body experience of their struggle so that they feel more of an inner freedom uh, to experience you know, the ranges of their thoughts, feelings, body sensations, imaginings, I think it's a great gift. It's, I, I feel I've had that great gift bestowed to me. But um, so basically, we're we're trying to help people where they're at, trying to relate to them in terms of their desire and capacity for change. And not everybody's desire and capacity is to go deep, existentially or experientially. Uh, and we, we try to recognize that, but we also try to be available to them to go deeper, to explore more deeply what they're experiencing as they're ready. And this is what we call existential integrative uh, psychology and psychotherapy. Uh, we've also been extending the existential and humanistic traditions more to diverse people uh, culturally uh, diagnostically, uh, ethnically, uh, you know, spiritually. So it's we've broadened our our range of work with with people, with a variety of people. Uh, when when the field began in the late fifties, early sixties, it was mainly with you know, white males or females of a higher economic status and social status. Uh, but we've really tried to break that down in more recent years and 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 
help help people realize the the richness of this approach for people of many many walks of life and many economic and social uh, you know statuses. So that's another area uh, that we've extended the approach. And uh, finally, we've we've extended it in terms of spirituality. There's uh, more of an emphasis now on uh, our relationship. Well, there's always been an emphasis on re our relationship to existence, but we're now opening that up to um, uh, more of a diverse range of how people experience that relationship. So we try to support people in finding purpose and meaning in their lives through their, their spiritual and even religious outlooks as well. The question is, does the spiritual or religious outlook uh, connect with their deepest uh, values and, and desires for living? But we, we are more open to that. I think in the past, we've been more, um, you could say, more secular-minded, uh, more atheistic. There's now more of an openness to broader dimensions. Uh, I myself have developed the, the area that I call awe-based psychology, A-W-E, the cultivation of the sense of awe toward living. And by awe, we mean the humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living. Humility having to do with a recognition of our great fragility and vulnerability in living, our smallness before the vastness of the, of the cosmos. And wonder having to do with our great capacity to transcend that smallness and that fragility through our imagination, through our uh, spiritual feeling of participating in something much greater than ourselves, uh, through our creativity and being able to, you know, recreate ourselves and our society, our, our freedoms, you know, to to choose uh, much about our, our life and our approach to life. So awe, the sense of awe is, I find, a very powerful spiritual concept because it, it really does uh, embody the, the paradoxes of our lives. The fact that we, we are like food for worms at one level, but we're soaring angels at another level. And if we could if we could uh, be aware of and connect with these very contrasting sides of ourselves, we can live a, a fuller and more enriching life. Uh, because even, even the so-called dark side or fragile small side has, has a certain beauty to it. I mean, it's, it's uh, this is what existentialism brings to humanistic psychology, the tragic dimension. So our limits and our 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 so-called negative emotion, our sadness, our fears, these can also, if we, if we can stay present to them, if we can uh, see them in their complexity, we can see that they, uh, make us more sensitive about our lives and toward other people. Um, they can uh, deepen our feeling for life. Like when you're, you're sad or you're anxious, these can also, if, if, we, if we're able to explore them and look at them more deeply, they can also make us more sensitive to you know, say the passing, passing nature of life, so it may make us want to live more fully in the moment, rather than just skip over it. Um, fears and anxieties can be signals 
of possibility of of freedom even um, we're often anxious and fearful when we're on the edge of discovery you know on the edge of wonder about something so i guess what i'm saying is uh, we're we're trying to bring to psychology and to everyday people a fuller and more complex uh, sense of living. Complex in a good way. <laughs> Helping people feel like um, basically that they, they have more access to themselves and to others in relationship because they're not as uh, blocked off again, from, from their whole body experience of life. They're, they're living more with their whole body experience. And this course opens up so many possibilities, both physically and, and mentally. That's a long answer, <laughs> but there's a, a lot going on in the field right now. Yeah, and, and we have some wonderful books coming out uh, through the American Psychological Association. Uh, they're coming out with a handbook of humanistic and existential psychology, um, which I've participated in. And also we have a chapter in the handbook of psychotherapy on existential, uh, humanistic and existential integrative psychotherapy. And, uh, and I'm, I'm coming out with a new book, uh, should be out in the winter called called Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. <laughs> so it's a similar idea. It's, you know, helping, trying to help us to be more present to that which is other or different and thereby live more fully and be more discovery oriented rather than just fixated on single points of view yeah thanks for the answer professor it's very uh, uh, nice answer to our question uh, i in my opinion uh, it's nice to hear that uh, existential humanistic uh, therapy approach uh, is trying to access a wide range of people from different uh, cultural and uh, sexual backgrounds yes uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's like uh, existential humanistic uh, approach is uh, focusing on uh, the discovering ourselves again uh, with uh, this connection. Uh, so, uh, Diamor, you can ask the next uh, next question. Uh, thank you for your answers, Professor. Um, you are a psychologist and psychotherapist uh, who has taken a leading uh, role in the advancement of existential integrative therapy. You have consider considerable editorial and publishing experience. Uh, I have also come across comments and uh, some of your books that have groundbreaking potential. Could you tell us about your writing processes according uh, to the approach uh, you pioneered? Yes, my, my writing process. Um, well, I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by my writing process uh, of the approach, but uh, I mean, maybe we can expand on this. I, I wasn't uh, quite clear. Let's see. Uh, what you had meant, but I, I think I think what you're asking is, you know, what what have I contributed maybe to the field um, that uh, you know has potential to reform or expand the field, and uh, I would say that some of the things I mentioned before that I, I've really worked a lot about uh, helping to bring this existential integrative approach 
uh, more uh, more known because I've I've long felt that existential psychologists have a lot to offer. Again, a wide variety of people, but but we've been uh, kind of contained. Uh, we we've been almost like uh, siloed. If you know what a silo is in a barn, it's just a a tower of hay, <laughs> and it's set, set apart from the rest of the farm, right? So uh, we're we're trying to sh show that uh, the field can reach people who are dealing with all kinds of levels of issues from, uh, let's say, more medical, mental health issues that have to do with, you know, having to take medication to uh, cognitive behavioral levels, if uh, that's that's where a person is most uh, focused on changing their thoughts, uh, thinking more rationally, um, you know, reconditioning them behaviorally so that so that they can adjust, so they can get along at their job or in their relationship. Um, so these are these are more adjustment kinds of psychology. But what we're bringing is the added invitation to people to look more deeply at their lives. Again, if they are ready and interested in doing this, to look more deeply at their lives and the whole question of what, what really matters about their lives, what deeply matters. You know, does it matter that they can now sleep and eat okay and they can go back to the same old job that they had before and function okay at the job or function okay in the old relationship? Or are they looking for something more about their lives, a purpose, a greater purpose, a greater meaning? Um, again, the sense of awe toward living, a spiritual connection with life. These are the kinds of matters that we that we are are, are offering uh, through our existential humanistic uh, philosophical and spiritual heritage that we have drawn on from from our our past our our ancestors in this field uh, and and so trying to bring that wonderful legacy out. I'm also been working with other people more on the social and political dimensions uh, that are applications of existential humanistic psychology, existential integrative psychology. Um, I personally have been involved in bridge building dialogues between uh, self-identified conservatives and liberals. And often we talk about them in terms of Republicans and Democrats here in the U.S. I've been involved as, as a trained moderator uh, with a group called Braver Angels. It's a national group. They've been doing a wonderful job um, bringing people together of highly contrasting backgrounds for, for humanizing dialogues to help them get past their stereotypes and their assumptions about each other and see each other as human beings. And uh, this I find to be a very fascinating sort of new movement uh, that applies existential, humanistic, and other psychologies. Uh, uh, personally, I, I've um, drawn from my experience with Braver Angels and what I was doing a decade before uh, in in a conflict mediation approach that I call the experiential democracy dialogue. And the experiential democracy dialogue is even more existential humanistic in that it involves a one-on-one -on -one encounter between somebody of a highly contrasting religious, political, racial, let's say, background. And through a series of stages, helps them or supports them again to see each other more as human beings 
rather than stereotypes or labels. And there are phases to this dialogue format. But I very much use some existential humanistic ideas uh, in the format. For example, uh, at the beginning of the dialogue, uh, before I, I even invite the two partners to talk with one another about their political or religious stands, I invite them to just envision what it might be like to sit with that person who is so different from you. What are the thoughts, feel, especially feelings, body sensations, images that come up for you as you envision sitting with that person with that very different point of view? And to try to do that mindfully, try not to fixate on any one feeling or sensation or image or association, but just watch them like you'd watch a river flowing past so that you're more aware, you're beginning to be aware of what's operating on you as you sit with that person. So you're beginning to see how psychological this whole thing is, uh, this type of approach, rather than just about talking with each other. And then I, I invite the two partners to see if you can clear a space to see the other as a full human being, rather than just your immediate reaction. So, uh, try to see the other person as a person who's struggling, you know, who has their own story, uh, who uh, has uh, wounds in their lives and, and great joys and, um, and, and has uh, some very human wants and needs just like you you know, maybe for safety, for security, for love. So that's just the beginning. That's the first phase. And, and then I have the partners talk about their background so that they know the context, more about the context of where they're coming from. Again, it humanizes the person rather than the person just saying what they believe. So you're getting an idea. Uh, so that's an area that we're working on, applying these principles to the social and political arena more and more. And I've been doing webinars on that. Um, and finally, uh, bringing it into, uh, again, what I would call awe-based psychology, spiritual psychology. Um, uh, we have many increasing numbers of people here in, in the U.S. who are searching for a religious or spiritual path that may not be their parents' path. Um, but that I think they're realizing more and more that it's, at least many people feel that it's very valuable to have some kind of spiritual path, some sense of the amazement of life and of participating in something much greater than oneself. And so uh, this is something that I've written quite a bit about uh, different books. And I, I think maybe one is in Turkish, I'm not sure, but uh, Awakening to Awe, uh, Rediscovery of Awe, Spirituality of Awe, these are all in that area. But I think in or uh, maybe maybe there, there was another book in Ex yeah, professor, <laughs> professor uh, your one book is translated to turkish uh, it's uh, existential, existential. Uh, humanistic therapy yeah, called, humanistic called, therapy yeah. Yeah. sorry uh, so i yeah. hope your more books translate to uh, <laughs> turkish well, thank you in the future. <laughs> thank you there, there is some about sure. these ideas in that book there's some about yeah. cultivating all etc so uh, anyway, I'm not the only one who's doing this. There's a number of us who are involved in uh, yeah. people like uh, Lewis Hoffman, very concerned with uh, bringing existential humanistic principles to uh, multicultural uh, situations and, and people, you know, from very, uh, again, very different backgrounds. How, how do... Uh, how to work with people who uh, 
just have different cultural or social views of, of life. So that, those are the kind of processes that I'm trying to uh, promote. Yeah. Okay, Professor. Um... Uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, existential humanistic approach is some kind of uh, helping people to see each other as a fully human 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 being, uh, rather than uh, their political uh, or religious point of view. And I think it's important to see each other as uh, just human being. Is that uh, all of these uh, adjectives, in my opinion, and uh, this is a great, uh, great job, Professor. In my opinion, uh, trying to achieve uh, that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, feels like it's feels like it's very much a universal problem right now. Or yeah. I should say a world, a world problem. Yeah. yeah. So much political, cultural conflict. Uh, yeah. Obviously. And and so, my point is, if we don't get to the deeper issues around these conflicts, you know, beneath the surface, and we'll be rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, so to speak, if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Make the window dressing look nice and the appearances look good and the behaviors look good, yeah. but you're not really necessarily getting to how people fear each other yeah. because they, agree. they've been brought up to fear life so often. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, ask your next question, Professor. Uh, you acknowledge that Maslow's work uh, awakened uh, his humanistic perceptions. At this point, I have uh, come across uh, in the sources that the EU theory is used as therapeutic method in uh, revealing life lives. Uh, well, can you tell us the details of this theory? How did your humanistic uh, perceptions take shape at this point? Well, based on, on Maslow's... Uh original ideas yeah. you're saying yeah 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 uh well maslow really opened us up to many of these dimensions uh, he he talked a lot about uh what he called the fourth force in american psychology the, the three others being uh, behaviorist psychoanalytic humanist and then trans what he was calling transpersonal psychology uh, or the spiritual dimension and he he began to talk about you know the need for beauty and and love and and awe for living and he he talked about it uh, often in terms of the idea of peak experience people ch achieving a high level of experiencing whatever it was they they were doing uh, often experts in, in, in fields. But I think we're, we're trying to bring a lot of these concepts to every day and to everyday people, everyday living, and that we can all uh, access uh, yeah, deeper and, and broader dimensions uh, of living. Um, so uh, if you'll give me, pardon me a moment, uh, I'm gonna take a look at the, the question that you gave me in English here, so that yeah, I can okay. have a little more sense of, of what yeah. you're asking. So yeah, right. You're talking about my my awe theory yeah. used as a, a therapeutic method yeah. in reviving lives. Um, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, how did your humanistic uh, perception affect uh, the foundation of this EU theory, I mean? Of the awe? Yeah. How the awe uh, this, how did your humanistic uh, perception uh, take shape uh, the, this, this theory that you made? Well, I, it, I mean, it began in my childhood when, when I was exposed to a profound sense of fragility and smallness. Yeah. But then through the presence of my analyst and, and later psychotherapist, and my parents also, in their way, uh, I was able to also not only experience the vulnerability of life, but possibility, you know, and begin to be intrigued and even fascinated by the bigger question. So that's that's kind of how it started. 
But I really see uh, the sense of awe as, uh, as integral or extremely important to existential humanistic and existential integrative psychotherapy. In fact, I see that kind of therapy as, as a staging ground for developing a sense of awe because what, what you're doing is you're inviting the patient to experience as fully and deeply as possible that which he or she is terrified of, right? That which he or she, which makes he or she feel extremely vulnerable, fragile, uh, small, weak, uh, helpless, groundless, without without grounding, uh, a kind of a, a free fall, you know, in life. So you're you're helping them to stay more present to those places, but at the same time. You're helping them to see that they have more resources than they realized often. And you're helping them come into the more of who they are. So this is the other part of awe. You're helping them just begin to move from a place of extreme terror and paralysis to gradual intrigue, curiosity, and maybe even risk-taking with some Thing that scared them before and and the risk taking can be with the therapist too because the therapist is very much alive in the relationship and is sharing his or her own experience in in a artful appropriate way hopefully uh sharing experience with the client and uh, so the client has a chance to begin to experiment with uh let's say uh, feeling okay or safe with the therapist because the therapist is so supportive, is so present, uh, or maybe getting angry at the therapist. So the client begin to experiment with anger uh, at the therapist or uh, taking a risk in disclosing something, saying something to the therapist that's very vulnerable. These are all help, helping the client to build an ability Ability to begin to venture out into the world more, to be bolder, to ask more questions, to, to begin to discover things rather than being in that little hole that they've been living in. So to me, this, this is, as I say, the staging ground for developing a sense of awe because ideally what a person emerges the way a person emerges from that process of going back and forth between utter terror and, and gradual wonder about life is that they develop after the therapy, hopefully, or in the later stages of the therapy, an ability to do that in everyday life, to experience life uh, in its rawness or fragility, uh, to be able to, to be sad if somebody's sad, and to be angry if you're angry, to be hurt if you're hurt, but also to be much more than that because you have all these other resources. You realize you have all these other capacities to be more than just this, just a depressive or just anxious or just phobic or obsessive, whatever. Yes, you have those feelings, and those can be powerful and, and actually informative. But you also have the ability to, you know, to look up at the sky and, and wonder, uh, to look up at the universe and wonder, uh, to, to look up from your cell phone. <laughs> you know, it's, as a, a cousin of mine put it, uh, to get beyond a four-inch screen and see the life that's going on around you, you know. Uh, yes, uh, to involve yourself in great conversations with people, let's say about, about movies or art or uh, something you read, uh, to be able to, to go deeper into life and, and to uh, 
Well, to experience, uh, as I say, the humility and wonder of living, which is really the adventure of living. Like you're in a dark forest, right? You don't know what's around the corner and all kinds of shapes and some things look threatening. And yet it, it's thrilling, right? It can be very thrilling to be in this mystery, just precisely because you don't know. <laughs> so to be able to be in a more of a don't know or unknowing place when you have that sense of inner freedom that greater sense of inner freedom is a, is a wonderful gift because it, again you're more open to surprise uh, uh, you're more open to something happening uh, that you didn't expect because because you're coming with an attitude of that openness you know like we sometimes think we're going to meet the same old person. It's the same old job, same old routine. Well, what if you came into that same job or in that same relationship with a, with a sudden different attitude? Let's see what we might discover here. Is there anything else I'm noticing about this job or person or moment that I didn't notice before? But again, you have to be able to have some security, some ability to be more fully present in order to experience that wider range. So that's a long way of saying that uh, uh, the awe theory is built into the therapy and hopefully you become more able to be with these, uh, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly yeah. in yourself. Uh, that opens up up your world. Uh, yeah, and I I call the last phase of my existential integrative approach the rediscovery of meaning and awe. Because the the therapy in many ways is based on holding a mirror up to a person, helping them see how they construct their world and how they're living their lives and continuing to invite them to question willing to live. Is that how they're willing to continue living? Uh, the choices, um, you know, how do they feel about their lives? Is it acceptable to them? So after that process and revisiting those places where they're blocked over and over, people often get to a place where they're, they're ready to throw it over the old defenses and the blocks and open up. Yes, I'm going to go for that job. I'm going to go for that relationship, that project that I've been yearning to do, but I'm too afraid to risk. So that's the rediscovery of meaning, overcoming that block of self-protection, which is no longer working, and potential for a whole new attitude toward life the awe, possibility for awe of uh, one is realizing that there, there's, there's always more <laughs> if, one, if one can stay with it until we die, we, we don't know. <laughs> In the process is uh, seeing life uh, from different perspectives mm -hmm. and uh, do not stuck in just one perspective and a uh, rediscovery mm -hmm. of uh, the other aspects of life is I think a great thing uh, about this theory in my opinion. Thank you. I, I and, just want to mention also uh, an area I've worked a lot on is what I call the polarized mind and and that's that's really the opposite of what I'm talking about about we get into a polarized mind or mindset which which is true i think on an individual level as well as a cultural level often it's the fixation on a single point of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view that's the polarized mind and that's the mindset we're often in when we go to psychotherapy because it's fear-based it's driven by fear and fear narrows our perception. And uh, 
and bringing in you know these more possibilities through presence helps to uh, limit or even break down the polarized mind yeah yeah uh, so Yamar, you can uh, ask the next next question to the professor. Thank you for your answer. Um, let's move on to our next question. Um, we know that existential existential based yes. ethics importance uh, to the future and give meaning to um, preference. And at this point, when we say the future, we can think of freedom. When we remove our borders with freedom, we cannot limit some choice with pathology. Can you tell us your point of view and pathology at this point? Well, I think what you're asking is the problem of freedom. I mean, freedom can be a great thing, but, um, but it can also be reckless and irresponsible. Is is that is that what you're asking about? Like, what kind of boundaries do we bring to freedom? Uh, I just want to be clear on the question here. Um, uh, one minute, professor. Uh, is it question six? Yeah, it's uh, question five, professor. Five. Yeah, five. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong one. So. Yes. So, um, well, I, I, you know, you're asking at this point when we say the future, we can think of freedom. When when we remove our borders with freedom, we cannot limit some choices with pathology. Can you tell you on pathology? At the, yeah, I was responding to so. Um, Rollo May wrote a book called Freedom and Destiny where I think he beautifully defined genuine freedom, and not just aimless, anything goes, do whatever you want. Because that can be a very superficial idea of freedom. It's, it's endless view and very yeah, you know, view where you're just operating on whim, you know, uh, or uh, because something came to mind. Now, is that really freedom? I think he has a point. No, I don't think that's really very freeing. It's actually, you're being driven by the latest thought or emotion. Not really a conscious choice. So he's saying that without responsibility, without some boundaries is, is more a recklessness or aimlessness that can be very destructive. Uh, so boundaries, responsibility is important with freedom. I agree with him. If we this to break it up and, and see it more clearly, it's the ability to respond. So freedom needs to be paired with the ability to respond. And it seems to me that we deepen the ability to respond, the more we become conscious about our lives, about what's operating on our lives, which is often subconscious or it's evident evident in some way, but it's unregarded. So, uh, so the deeper we go into being aware about our lives and how we operate in the world, you almost can't avoid uh, being more thoughtful, it seems to me, about what you do with your freedom. Because you're going to be, again, more sensitized to the fragile parts of yourself and of others, the hurts, the wounds, sadness, uh, you're, you're going to come into a place where you develop an ethics, a sort of ethical 
perspective as you go deeper. I would say generally that this is true because you you are feeling things more deeply. You're not you're not just going to say anything that comes to mind. Let's say to your partner. Uh, if if you have if you have a deeper and and larger consciousness, you're going to be you're going to be attuned uh, to what might what might uh, be most helpful or supportive or uh, communicative to my partner at this time. That's genuine freedom where you're you're reflecting on, you're, you're deliberating, reflecting on with your whole body experience, how best to respond in the situation. So yes, I, I, I think that uh, Rallo May is very accurate that we, we need to be aware of uh, the ethical, implications of our freedom um, but we don't we also don't want to there's some, some balance here because we don't want to be so preoccupied with responsibility part or the destiny part as he might put it um, that we we forget uh, our choices and our, our imaginations, our creativity. Uh, so there is some balance there. The point being that freedom is a, a very, uh, a very heavy and uh, many-sided experience and concept. And It needs to be treated as such, um, especially if you don't feel like you have any strict guidelines for how to live. And this is one of the existential problems or questions. How do we live if there's no absolute authority telling us exactly what to do? <laughs> um, how do we live when we feel helpless and groundless? It's a heavy responsibility. Uh, but I, I do think that good psychotherapy, especially depth psychotherapy, existential oriented psychotherapy, helps people to develop that ability to be, to be, uh, good good shepherds good uh, therapeutic guides for themselves because they've learned through a lot of hard work what again what what deeply matters here what deeply matters about my life and and our lives in the world that's really the question that the whole approach is getting it. And if you're guided by that question, again, not just with your head, but with your whole body experience, I think that's the best we can do as far as acting more responsibly with an ability to respond and acting more ethically. You know, if, if we're, if we've really struggled with these deeper questions about what deeply matters in our lives. That's the ethical basis right there. Yeah. And we see this, We unfortunately, we don't usually see this in the big power centers of the world. And I've studied this through history, going way back to Babylonian times, even. Uh, we, we tend to be in Greco-Roman times. I mean, the power centers tend to be 
more polarized, you know, fixated on single points of view to the exclusion of other points of view. And so they're not really probing these deeper questions about how shall we live in the fullest and best way possible. Um, I'm not saying that they don't have some good answers, they do, but I don't think we've gone nearly deeply enough. And so, uh, so anyway, those are the kind of questions we're raising now about forging a new, a new ethics that allows people, that supports people to live more fully, more richly uh, their lives. And freedom is key, but so is the ability to respond, responsibility. Yeah. Uh, professor, in my opinion, uh, uh, most of us uh, do not aware of our freedom and uh, free of to make our choices. Uh, so it arises to many questions uh, in our heads, uh, in my opinion. Yes. Just want to say that. Yeah. So let me ask your next question, uh, question six. Uh, sometimes we think that uh, life has an end, that we already have limited memories. When we use these concepts, we wondered about your perspective on existential anxiety. How is our existential anxiety affected at the point of freedom? At the same time, by adopting these, the existential and humanistic perspective, can you tell us how we transform existential anxiety into neurotic anxiety? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, much of what I've been talking about can be understood in terms of what I call life-enhancing anxiety. Uh, now, now, most most when we talk about anxiety, we emphasize the dread, the nervousness, the, you know, the sweating and the racing heart and the uh, the kind of closing down of our world. Um, we don't recognize enough the the wonder that is contained in much anxiety. I'm, I'm not talking about all anxiety. Uh, there, there is anxiety that legitimately has to come up just to, so we survive, right? If there's a tiger in the woods, he's about to attack us. We have what we call signal anxiety, right? Yeah. So it's immediate physiological reaction, fight or flight, usually flight, yeah. you take flight. Um, and, and these are all legitimate and survival oriented. Uh, but there's so many ways, places in our society where we, we don't confront uh, the, the anxieties that are, are more out of our prejudices, our uh, fears that have been passed down from generation to generation about certain things or people. And a lot of that can be BS, as we say. Uh, but it's done so that that culture or maybe those parents don't have to face the, the unsettlement, uh, the unease of uh, what they've been afraid of so long, uh, of the other person or of, of certain things around us. Um, it's a lot easier to, to just cover cover it up, you know, with either entertainments or, you know, uh, we have a very quick fix, instant result culture through computers that helps distract us from these deeper questions often. Uh, we have ideologies, we have religions. Uh, again, some of these have great aspects to them 
but some of them are, are just covers, they're cover up for avoiding, uh, avoiding the deeper questions. And so life enhancing anxiety is anxiety that enables us to live with and make the best of the depth and mystery of existence. Now that's my philosophical definition of it. Uh, maybe uh, a definition that's a little more concrete is it's anxiety that enables us to live with and make the best of the contrasts and contradictions of life. And that's, that's all of what I'm talking about right there as far as all the struggle and the therapies that I've been talking about in my own life too, is work difference with contrast and contradiction. And we all have these contrasts and contradictions in our lives. When death comes up, illness comes up, when somebody different comes into our world, uh, uh, so the, the life enhancing anxiety response to that would be to acknowledge that you have unsettlement, you have unease, discomfort, let's say with a conversation with somebody who's on the opposite side of your political view, you have all these anxious feelings, uh, but you, you don't reduce yourself to, to those sort of shadow sides of anxiety. You open up to what I call life enhancing anxiety. You're able to, to see those initial reactions uh, as, as reactions that are part of a, a much bigger possibility in engaging with whatever the object or the person is in front of you. And that's that's life enhancing because it, it potentially can enrich and enhance lives. It can better our lives if we're more, more discovery oriented, if we can learn from each other and attempt to understand each other. That opens our worlds. I mean, that that's what creative people have been doing for a long time. They've been noticing much more than, you know, your average person when they walk down the street or they observe something and they can put it in their paintings. They can, they can put it in their sense of, of joy or amazement about living. Uh, in their writings or buildings or, you know, whatever it is that's, that's kind of pushing that, that border of, of the routine and familiar. That's really what the life enhancing anxiety does is pushing that border of the routine and familiar so that it opens us to, uh, yes, something potentially very scary, but if we can be more present to it again, we may see that what looked like a monster at first is opening us to the universe. <laughs> and to bigger questions, deeper questions. Again, if, if we're not immediately threatened by a tiger or a gun, that is no time for life enhancing anxiety, or it's very difficult, obviously. But uh, there's more room for it than we think, I believe. And, and cultures often show that, right? They, if they're, if they're attacked, but not necessarily immediately threatened, um, they often just attack right back without any thinking or reflecting on it, even though they may not be under threat by that other nation, let's say. Um, but it's an understandable reaction by people who are coming more from a fear-based place than, uh, could say, a, a wonder-based place or 
uh, a place of greater inner inner security, inner capacity to be present. Is that making sense? Yes, Professor. A lot uh, seeing uh, a good potential in in anxiety is very creative uh, that you mentioned, like that you mentioned mm -hmm. before. So um, I think uh, uh, as people, we should uh, try to focus on this good potential uh, in this anxiety, in my opinion. Well, I take the risk to be in some uncomfortable situations or uncomfortable conversations yeah. with people. Yeah, exactly. That's what these bridge building dialogues are. They, they, they can be uncomfortable, but they can also be fascinating and, and open you to lifestyles and ways of thinking that you hadn't thought about before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Yamor, you can ask the next question to the professor. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, we can see that the existential and humanistic approach general, generally concentrates uh, on one point and progresses. But is there a reason why you adopt uh, these two perspectives at the same time? Have there been moments where these approaches have fit and contrasted in your career? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, it, it goes to the question of the humanistic psychology tradition in America as distinct from the existential uh, philosophy and psychology position of Europe um, and, and how the two were brought together uh, by Rollo May, for example, so that we formed existential and humanistic. Uh, I, I think, and I, I've certainly been affected by both. I mean, my father was more on the humanistic side, uh, which tends to emphasize uh, human potential and, uh, you know, creativity, uh, optimism, um, a kind of practical, can-do, practical mentality that's very American. Uh, maybe emphasizes, well, certainly emphasizes the human over that which is beyond the human. Um, I think the humanistic brings a lot of great ideas and, and has been very helpful for our culture, you know, scientifically, practically. But it doesn't, in my view, hasn't gone as deep as the existentialist tradition. And so what the existentialist tradition brings is not only our relationship to human beings, but our relationship to existence. Uh, it, and thereby brings the, the tragic dimension of living. It's been called the tragic dimension. Maybe not the best uh, way of putting it because that tragic dimension can bring a depth and a, a poignancy and a spirituality that uh, can be very moving and, and very uh, awe-inspiring for people, for myself. And so that's why I came around to the existential in connection with the humanistic, because I feel like they're both really important. The, the existential brings a certain uh, depth dimension and recognizes uh, our limitations more than the humanistic has traditionally done in America. And recognizes uh, that we're participating in something much greater than ourselves. And I think that helps us get past some of the narcissism of the humanistic uh, potential movement, the humanistic psychology movement, where I think we, we went a little bit uh, um, awry uh, by overemphasizing the human as distinct from the human in relation to something greater. Uh, uh, because when you overemphasize the human, you, you start to move away from humility. And that could be a problem. Uh, we, we've seen some of the extremes that can come out of that. You know, not only uh, some of the extremes of the humanistic 
psychology movement with the uh, pretty wild experiments with you know with drugs with sexuality with cults um, and some of these have become they became dangerous or destructive not necessarily even physically but emotionally destructive for people because they're too much they're not recognizing that we're we're all fragile uh little beings at the same time as we're these great inventors and and transcenders right we have to recognize both otherwise we get in trouble um and and so the existential brings that dimension it makes us more aware of our fragility but at the same time like the philosophy of Taoism, it it gets us out of our way <laughs> And, and opens us up to that vastness uh, that is out there, which can help to lift us out of some of the, uh, the petty and narrow identifications we get into, the, the critical judgments you know, we hit ourselves with, narrow uh, put-downs, you know, devaluing ourselves, which happens so easily. Uh, in, in that if you can connect with that bigger picture and even though it can be unsettling and maybe even scary it can also be so lifting of us out of something that just doesn't matter that much you know often these little criticisms that we hit ourselves with um, and, and what what matters in the end is that we live as fully as possible, love as fully as possible. I, I feel this is very related to loving. It's 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 about being able to love life and love the cosmos. Uh, and theref therefore, love ourselves and others. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your answer, Professor. Uh, this question uh, will be more specific uh, than that. Uh, the question is, uh, what's the difference uh, between Yellum's existential psychotherapy and your existential integrative therapy? Well, there, there's a lot of overlap. Um, I I ag agree with uh, his basic themes about the givens of life, uh, you know, freedom and limitation, yeah. uh, finitude, and and uh, well, infinitude. <laughs> I mean, he he's got these different categories: of isolation versus connection meaning versus meaninglessness. I, I think these are all very important existential themes and I give him a lot of credit for identifying those. Um, I think where we differ is that uh, I, I think the, the basic issue in, in all of these themes that he identifies is is our relationship to existence is our smallness before the vastness of creation and and our sense of groundlessness and helplessness in the face of that um so i i guess i see the givens as kind of boiling down to that we we feel that sense of groundlessness and helplessness when we don't have meaning we feel the sense of groundlessness and helplessness when we're extremely isolated. We see, feel the sense of groundlessness and helplessness when we're overly connected with somebody else and, and our identities are wiped out because we're fused with others. Uh, so uh, in any case, that's one area that we, we have some difference but I'd say that the main area areas of difference are, are the existential integrative aspect 
where Yalom focuses more on a traditional existential exploratory approach with patients and doesn't at least doesn't make explicit how we can work with patients who may not have the desire or capacity for that deeper exploration. And that's what I've been trying to do with the existential integrative, show how, how again, sometimes medical approaches can be helpful, sometimes physiological or somatic approaches can be helpful, even breathing exercises, muscle relaxation. Uh, sometimes cognitive behavioral interventions can be helpful. It's meeting the person where they're at. He, he does some of that and he talks about the existential as being important for you know most of the therapies or all of the therapies, but just doesn't make it as explicit. And then finally, he tends to be, in my opinion, um, or understanding, he tends to be more, um, more atheistic about the existential perspective than I am. I call myself an enchanted agnostic. What does that mean? That means that I take mystery very seriously and, and the radical unknowing, unknowing very seriously. And, I, and he takes mystery seriously also, but he, he doesn't believe in the possibility of, of a God. I believe in the possibility of a God. Um, but I also believe in the possibility that there may not be a God. But uh, my point is, uh, I, I, I feel that our connection with something greater than ourselves is extremely important. If one can experience it with one's whole body and not just the intellect, uh, not just reducing it to formulations, and this is where traditional science, I think, doesn't go far enough in helping us understand the human condition. Uh, you know, you can reduce a lot of these things to uh, brain brain processes um, or calculations that have not yet been made. That's how some scientists define that which we don't know. Well, it hasn't been calculated yet, hasn't been verified yet. Well, I, I think all of this, <laughs> this spiritual area is, is beyond calculation. I don't think we're going to get at it in that way. So uh, my, my point is, uh, um, in, in my perspective, his view is a, a little bit overly intellectualized when it comes to spirituality and religion. Uh, I identify more with the spiritual existentialists like Martin Buber, Abraham Heschel, Gabriel Marcel, uh, Paul Tillich, uh, and Rollo May and Ernest Becker, R.D. Lang. I mean, all of these people, I think, believe that when, when we experience life with our whole body, we come to some kind of spiritual sensibility that is very important as far as achieving purpose and meaning in living. At least for many people, this is what they come to when they can experience life with their whole body and not just with their intellect or from a strictly conventional scientific point of view. So, and he comes out of psychiatry, I come out of psychology, you know, so he, he's coming more from a, 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 psych, a, a med, medical model, although he broke out of that in many ways. And as I say, I give him great credit for popularizing the perspective. Um, I just think there are areas that we need to expand, expand on and deepen. I'll just say also he works more at with the relationship and and I I work with the the relationship I think he's very good on the relationship uh, but I also work with the individual inviting that person to stay as fully present 
to, again, the body sensations, images, feelings that come up, and really try to give a lot of space for that. Not only what's happening between us, but what's happening within that person. And that's a lineage I take more from James Bugenthal because he was my main clinical mentor. So, and I see a lot of value to it. But I, I think my growing edge is to work more relationally. Thanks for the answer. Uh, uh, this uh, really makes sense because before I start, uh, I am really curious about uh, what is the main difference between existential psychotherapy and your existential integrative therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's like uh, your therapy model is more holistic than the uh, existential psychotherapy. Well, I, I see it that way. I, it, You probably find existential psychotherapists who think their view is very holistic. But I, I, I don't think their holism has been made as explicit as it needs to be. I mean, if we're really talking about whole, we, we need to yeah. talk about the many levels of our consciousness. And people are at a whole variety of, of those levels. Where we come together is I believe in being available to that person, no matter where they're coming from at a level of consciousness, uh, to be available to that deeper experiential uh, level of contact. And by experiential, I mean immediate, the affective, the kinesthetic or embodied level, yeah. and the profound or cosmic. That's where you get into the spiritual. Uh, thanks for the answer, Professor, again. Uh, so, Yamur, you can ask the next question. Uh, thank you for your answer, Professor. Mm, question nine. Uh, existential integrative therapy model differs uh, from existential humanistic therapy for embracing divorce levels of clinic. Can you explain that difference more detailed to us? Well, uh, let's see. So th this is the one about uh, existential integrative therapy differs from existential humanistic therapy for embracing diverse levels of of the client. Yes, which I just spoke to. Can you explain the difference uh, in a more detailed way? Um, I go back to basically what I said before traditional existential humanistic therapy and existential psychotherapy is not as explicitly attuned to the client's desire and capacity for change as the existential integrative approach. And what I mean by that is that more that traditionally existential and existential humanistic therapists tend to see people who have that desire and capacity for that deeper level of contact and the ability to explore that. I want to see our therapy open up to a much more diversity of people who may have that capacity but may not have it at a given stage of the work and they need to build up toward it by working, let's say, as I say, more at the medical level, more at the physiological or at the cognitive behavioral level, interpersonal level, before they're ready and, and actually desirous of going deeper. Um, so that that's a major difference. It's an expansion on the, the traditional existential approaches, which again worked mainly with you know white upper class or upper middle class patients, uh, European oriented patients. And, uh, you know, that that just, it doesn't make sense to me just in terms of our philosophy. If you're going to talk about existential and humanistic philosophy, you got to talk about all people's existence and all people being human. <laughs> and so let's move the field along that path, you know. 
uh, we're trying to do that, but hopefully you all will help us as well in, in your work and in your inquiries, um, because I think we need help to, to uh, provide the most relevant kind of contact from an existential point of view to a person. Okay, thanks for the answer again, Professor. Uh, let me ask you the next question. Uh, I would like to talk about the concept of uh, authenticity, which symbolizes the adoption uh, to the outside world without compromising its own values. At this point, why don't we choose to be authentic? And does being authentic also reveal our point of exclusion? Yeah, I think that uh, it's it's very difficult to be authentic or more fully authentic in uh, uh, in societies, or I should say, contemporary Western societies in particular, that have a great deal of emphasis on speed, instant results, and appearance and packaging the surfaces of things, as opposed to the inner inner life, interior life. When you have that kind of emphasis, it's very hard to take the time to be more fully present to what deeply matters to one. And, and that is so central to authenticity, is, is being able to take the time to uh, clarify, to choose, uh, a way of expressing oneself, a way of moving through the world that that feels aligned, right? Feels very aligned with one's core values, one's core uh, desires. Um, beliefs about the world. Um, so it, it raises questions about how authentic can people be when mo many much of their lives are run by computers or at least um, affected, impacted by computerization. Now that's kind of ironic here because I think this is an example of having an encounter that is very enriching, at least that's my experience, and we're from different cultures, and and I feel that we are being very authentic with each other over a computer, yeah. <laughs> right? So I'm going against what I just said in, in a way, but, but my point is that we, I think we need to use our computers and our technology much more for this sort of meaningful you know communication and and communication that that enables our authentic being to, to come out much more um, ideally that would be face to face still i guess i'm old-fashioned enough to believe that, that actually the living breathing people you know who can kind of smell and taste and, and hear and touch one another uh, brings dimensions that just the thin wafer is, is not bringing. Also, you see more too. I, I'm seeing your faces pretty much. You're seeing yeah. similar. Um, yeah, so... I guess my fear is, and I brought this out in my books, The Spirituality of Awe, Challenges to the Robotic Revolution. My fear is that we are growing generations that perhaps will not have that deeper sense of authenticity that we're referring to now, or that existentialists have talked about, because they haven't been brought up with it. 
you know, and if the parents are preoccupied with the smartphones and the net surfing or the, the quick, quick answers, the texting, et cetera, and they're looking into their phones and not into their sons or daughters or children, yeah. uh, into their eyes or, or, or having more prolonged conversations with them and you know what they like about life what they want in life uh, what the parent likes and wants in life um well we have that authentic consciousness and you know as virtual reality the same as actual reality I mean, these these are increasingly important questions you know is taking a pill or having mechanical device to help you do something more proficiently the same as doing that without these devices? I think a, a huge example of that is the question of expertise in whatever field. So can you be an expert psychologist if you're an app and you're just you, you're, you're, the app is just telling people what algorithms have been programmed into it to tell people at certain times because probabilities say mathematically that this is what will help that person when they make that statement. You know, or if you have manuals that the therapist is going by that that are computerized or al algorithm based based on statistics averages, is that the same as? Encountering a human being, two human beings, being, you know, in, in, in connection with one another. Uh, you know, if you have a mechanical device that makes you a, a great, a great performer, let's say a, a musician, is that the same as tearing your hair out and working with the piano or the guitar? sweating, uh, upset, agonized, frustrated, ecstatic in that whole process of learning to be a great musician? Are those two the same, you know, or a great athlete? We're going to have to face these questions as we move into the future because we, we will have machines that simulate uh, proficiencies. We already have them. So we, I think we need to really face these these questions about authenticity. Yeah. At this point, uh, Professor, in my opinion, uh, in uh, today's society, uh, which uh, we are more uh, mechanized uh, with uh, these technologies, uh, humanist, uh, existential humanistic approach is uh, very important because it focuses on these important uh, questions that arise with mm. the technology. So I hope uh, existential humanistic approach uh, can uh, achieve uh, that connection between uh, all of us in brief. I appreciate that. And I think you said the, the main term there, which is raise questions. Yeah, thanks, Professor. It's really important. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Amor, you can ask the next question. Mm, thank you for your answer, Professor. Uh, some people can walk uh, around um, white and mask on their face and wear uh, various emotional masks. Uh, why are, are most of you so afraid that if other people really got to know us, they will not uh, want to be with us? Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying before about our, our increasingly uh, a technologized world. Uh, one of the, the prices of that is that perhaps people um, feel less affirmed by each other. Uh, feel less lovable or feel like they're not enough. You know, that whole thing of fear of missing out. <laughs> we call it FOMO. Um, 
you know, because you've gone in a quick fix, instant result world, you want to be everywhere doing everything as you know, quickly and as much as possible. You're also doing a lot of comparing. People are doing a lot of comparing of images they see on screens to themselves and, and often feeling very depressed because of that or isolated because they're not getting the living, breathing human contact from another person. Now, I think all of these things add to uh, a, a, a kind of a fear, fears of rejection um, and of not being met, not being met by another person. And so it's hard to let your mask down when when you don't feel like you're going to be met um, and and appreciated for you yourself, if you know what I mean. Not not just the way you look or uh, something you something you've uh, pointed to in a in a text or. Uh, you know, or or that you use because it's the latest fashion, it was in the advertising. Uh, I think that's what you're asking, but maybe I should recheck in. Is that, is that what you're asking about people wearing masks, not wanting to let down their masks because yes, they're perfect. afraid? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you got the point. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, too too much masking in in that way. Um, yeah. It's protection. It's protection, and and again, I do think it goes back to this uh, primal fear, primal issue of not feeling met as a child, either to some degree by the parents and to some degree by the culture. Uh, we need to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you the next question, Professor. Uh, if you could send a message uh, to Spinoza readers and psychology students around the world, what would it be? You save the toughest for last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely, Professor. Um, so many messages that I'd, I'd like to communicate. I guess I have, but uh, to, to boil it down, be more aware of how important your person-to-person -person contacts with people are right from the start of life. So for uh, parent, prospective parents out there, to be aware of how vital first contacts with your baby are in forming them, shaping them. Try to be aware, therefore, of your own fears, how they're operating on you, how they're affecting you, um, how they may be affecting your child or a friend, what have you. Can, can you meet another person as a person, recognizing that they have their own wants and desires and fears, interests? Can we cultivate that? Can we even celebrate that? And still be in relationship with them with our own wants and desires. Uh, this is a part of the challenge, I think. Um, so just to be, how, be more conscious of uh, the gift of, of life, the preciousness of the very fleeting time that we have had here on the planet. Uh, to uh, to live 
life, to live a life that deeply matters and to keep, keep that, keep, keep that uh, message, that sentiment in mind as we're living. How do we, how are, well, two ways of putting it is how are we presently living? And to really check in with that. And often psychotherapy is necessary or very helpful in that process. And then how are we willing to live based on what we see in the mirror? Um, you know, what is acceptable to us? What is not acceptable? And can we even take that out of our heads and actually put it into action of what really matters and respond to it? And in my view, experience, this can bring a, a, sense, a greater sense of awe toward living and a, and a greater, uh, a more... Uh, a more enriching and caring ethics to the world, to ourselves and others. Oh, That's where I would... Yeah, it's a very good answer. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, last question, Professor. Mm, is there anything else you want to add? I think I've probably given you much more than <laughs> than you expected <laughs> or or desired, maybe I don't know. Um, well, the, the one thing that I would add is I, I thank you all very much for this intimate time, and uh, you were terrific interviewers because you you really demonstrated presence to me, to yourselves as well, in allowing me a space. To uh, to really uh, elaborate my perspective, and uh, for that, I give you utmost compliments. Uh, uh, this this forum really allowed for a deepening of conversation. The only big thing missing is that I didn't hear more of your side, but I did appreciate. Your comments, uh, is it Aitung? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, your responses and and Yagmar as well, your thoughtfulness and relating and, and putting this together. And I, I imagine you have other staff, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for accepting interview offer. Uh, can we get 